All right, so hi, thanks for coming. I can't believe how many people are here. I'm totally stunned. So it's early for a DEF CON. Uh, you know, there's ATM jackpotting going on. There, in another talk, there's a, there's a Playmate of the Year or something, right? Uh, it's, I know, that's fine. I, I saw her though, she's not that cute, so. Uh, and uh, what else? So the, I mean, anyway, I was really surprised there's people here, so thanks for coming. And uh, I, I was like, optimistically, the room will be empty. Everyone who can't get into Barnaby Jack's talk will then be like, well, what the hell do we do now? And they might wander in, but uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Okay, so this talk, uh, and I warn you, it's, it's, there's probably too much material, so I'm gonna probably end up skipping stuff, but I'll make the slides available online, so if I glo gloss over something you're more interested in, check out the slides and, and see. Um, so this talk is supposed to be uh, uh, sort of a, a, a fictional story of, um, so I, you know, I travel and give talks around the world, and so like what would happen if like one day I was, you know, visiting some foreign country and, you know, next thing I knew there's like a bag over my head. And a couple hours later I wake up and I'm in, you know, beautiful downtown, uh, you know, some city in North Korea. And uh, <laughs> Kim Jong-il and, his, you know, his friends are, are there insisting that, that I help them build a cyber army to attack the U.S. So, so this is the story. So, and, and when you're in that situation, you know what you say, right? Yes, sir. Right? So for that. <laughs> Here we go. Here's my, my uh, Korean military uniform right. for the day. All right. So ready to fight. Yeah. So who's, who's with me, right? Okay. So uh, yeah, that's what, that's what you say. Yes, uh, you know, devoted leader. Okay. So, uh, so what am I going to talk to you guys about? So a little about me. Uh, normally I would just skip that, but this talk is all sort of like, you know, like BS and, and all that. So I want to sort of convince you I know what I'm talking about. And then uh, some background stuff, strategies I would employ, uh, potential attacks, things that my cyber army would have to do, things I could imagine uh, defensively, uh, the U.S. or whatever country we were attacking would try to do and why it wouldn't work. And then uh, exactly how I would, I would have the army, you know, who would be in it, what kind of people, how much it would cost, that sort of stuff. Um, then how long I would need to set up, what exactly I would do. And uh, then, you know, conclusions and lessons learned. Okay. So, uh, w so why am I talking about, uh, you know, cyber war? So out of the blue, some guy from NATO calls me uh, like three or four months ago. And he's like, hey, Charlie, we'd like you to come to Estonia and give us a talk about cyber war. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm really good. I, you know, I'm like a low-level tech guy. I don't know how to like break into computers and stuff like that. But I don't really know much about, you know, cyber war. So I don't know, uh, you know, policies. I don't know, you know, what country has what or, you know, anything like that. I just know how to break into computers. And so I'm like, sorry, you know, I'm going to have to decline. But then the more I thought about it and then I started reading like, uh, you know, Richard Clark's book. And I was like, man, you know, most of the people who are talking about cyber war, they don't really know. They might know what they're talking about, but they don't really know like the details like I know, right? Um, so I thought, oh, that'd be kind of fun. Uh, you know, and, and I was like, well, what do you really want me to talk about? And he's like, well, anything you want. I was like, well, you know, I'll talk about what I know, which is offense. So, I'll, I, so, so he convinced me to come. I gave the talk. And, uh, you know, there were some technical guys there, mostly like policy types. There was uh, an ex-former uh, cyber czar of the U.S. was there watching my talk. And apparently she was like, you know, didn't like it or something. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, that's your boss? No, she was probably lost. Oh, yeah, maybe. It's not too technical. That, like, you know, my, my talk of Black Hat had, like, hundreds of slides with, like, assembly. No, no assembly in this talk. Okay, so anyway, I was like, well, I'd like, you know, where else can I give this talk besides to these NATO guys? So I was like, well, you guys at DEF CON might appreciate it, so that's why I'm here. Okay, so who am I? Uh, I'm a PhD in math, worked for a year, reading firewall logs. I used to work at the NSA for five years. Uh, I'm a consultant now, and that's basically what this talk is about. So it's it's uh, it's like a proposal. So I do this all the time as a consultant. So uh, you know I'm good. I'm good at a you know breaking in things, and then b figuring out like how much stuff's going to cost, how much time it's going to take. So that's really what this 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 talk is. It's like a proposal to to a country to to build a cyber army. I did some other stuff too. Okay. So uh, so what about you? Don't hear much about what people say what they did at the NSA. Um, and for, for, for good reason. And I can't talk about it either, but there, I can't tell you bullets from my, my uh, resume that they approved. So these are things I can talk about without further comment. So uh, these are things I did about the NSA to show that like maybe I know what I'm talking about. So uh, performed computer network scanning and reconnaissance. Executed numerous computer network exploitations against foreign targets. Like I can't believe they allow me to say that, but they do. <laughs> um, network intrusion analysis designed and developed network intrusion blah blah blah. So anyway, so I did some cool stuff as, as a as a you know NSA guy. 
Okay, so, so on to the basics. <laughs> By the way, it's cold in North Korea. I didn't know that. I didn't pack for it. Alright, so, um, so you know the bottom line and all this stuff is money, right? So if you have enough money you can do pretty much anything you want. So uh, for some comparison of what people are spending on this sort of stuff. So the US military spends, you know, a crap load of money. Uh, just on cyber alone they spend 105 million dollars a year. And these are all the things I found on Google. Like again, I said I'm not really an expert on this. Um, North Korea spends 5 billion, which is a ton for, for their little country. Um, on cyber warfare alone they spend 56 million. So that's a lot. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, Iran, by comparison, you wouldn't think they would have one. They actually spend more, 76 million. And so the, what I'm going to propose is actually a bargain. 49 million dollars and I can take down any country. <laughs> okay, so cyber warfare, what do I think it is, right? Everyone disagrees so since I'm talking I get to say what I think it is. It's collecting intelligence, controlling other systems. So, you know, making them do what maybe you don't want them to do. Maybe you just want to make it where people can't use the systems that they want to use. Um, you know, and uh, you know, maybe General Hayden, my old boss, would disagree, but you know, the general idea is you want to cause harm, like if you you launched missiles and stuff without actually having to, to go through that trouble of doing that. Okay, some more statistics just to get kind of get uh, uh, a realm on on you know some your head around some of these numbers because you know we're used to at least me as a pen tester we're used to like you know corporations or something. So so like it, now our target's sort of like the world. So so what sort of numbers are we talking about? It's so like lots of you know a few billion IP addresses in the world. 2 billion personal computers, 41 million iPhones, so that's a lot of iPhones. Uh, what about botnets that you hear about? How big are they compared to, you know, all the computers in the world? Well, they range anywhere from like, you know, 3 to 10 million uh, computers. And so if you think about it as a percentage of all computers, it's still a fraction of 1%. So, you know, very small percentage of computers. And if you think about like all the people you know that have computers that have no idea how they work, it's amazing that it's not larger actually. Okay, so here's a word I throw around so just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, it's the remote access tool, RAT. So it's, you know, you can think of it like a rootkit or like, you know, the equivalent of like a really advanced interpreter or something. So it's something that, that you're going to put onto a computer that you've compromised that allow you continued access, allow you to then uh, attack other computers, um, you know, basically a way to, to, to contact this computer that you've broken into at some point. And I like it, so it should be hard to detect. Yeah, no kidding. Okay, so now uh, a little divergence into zero days and I, I'll try not to spend too much time because, you know, this audience probably understands what a zero day is and, and why they're important. Uh, where the guys at NATO, like I don't know if they, they really, I wanted to really emphasize like, hey, you know, there's these things called zero days. So, uh, you know, as you know, it's for uh, a bug that, that there's no patch available for. Um, so, so then I, I want to emphasize to them that these exist and, you know, you guys probably know that but just for some stats. Uh, so 2005, so these are mostly ones I know about since, you know, I know about stuff I do. So um, 2005 I found a bug in Samba. It was around for two years. So you know, that's a long time for a bug. Uh, there was this one, this JBIG2 Adobe Reader vulnerability. Um, discovered in 2008. This is discovered by a bad guy this time. Uh, if, if you, I mean, I'm wearing a military uniform from Korea so maybe I'm not one to speak about who's good and who's bad. But uh, this is like a real bad guy. And uh, so he found it in 2008 and it, it didn't get par uh, patched until March even though people knew about it. So, you know, these zero days are floating around. Uh, Pwned in one year I found a bug but I didn't use it because you can only use one so I kept the second one for the next year. So a year went by, nothing happened. And of course, like yesterday I dropped a zero day Adobe Reader 1 at Black Hat so, or a few days ago this week. So yeah, zero days exist. Okay, uh, what about like how long they're around? Because this is going to be kind of important because, uh, you know, I'm going to have my, my army, you know, finding these zero days. So I want to know, you know, what their shelf life is. So these stats come from uh, Justin Itell, the CEO of Immunity, uh, the company that, may, that brings you, uh, you know, uh, Canvas, uh, amongst other things. Uh, so uh, anyway, the average lifespan, she says, from, from her statistics, 348 days, so just under a year. And the shortest one that they've ever had, 99 days, and the longest one was almost three years. So that, that'll give you an idea of how long you can expect your zero to, to sit around. Right, and then, uh, you know, from the defender's perspective, it's pretty tough to, to find zero days because, you know, you don't know what they are. Um, this, uh, this little dialogue box is like, I think it's a pretty funny story. So I had the zero day and, uh, you know, we were doing something with it for someone else, right? I can't say more than that. But anyway, uh, we were, nonetheless, we were testing it against lots, you know, lots of different targets. And I was like, well, you know, what about, we were trying to find all the Windows boxes we could. And I was like, oh, well, you know, what about the secretaries? We haven't tried her. So, you know, I threw the, the zero day against it and it was like, boop, little, pop up. It's like buffer overflow blocked. I was like, what? 
McAfee detected my zero day. There's no way. So I was, yeah, it, it really worked. Um, except like the, the only like small piece of solace I had was if you read the description, it's like, oh, there's a buffer overflow, and I was like, ah, well, it wasn't actually a buffer overflow, but still they detected it. So it sort of sort of made me sad, but then of course you could you know get around it. But um, still, it, you can detect zero days just by using heuristics and stuff. Okay, so uh, next up, strategies. <laughs> yeah, they don't eat good either in North Korea. They eat some weird stuff. So. Uh, so here's my strategies. Dominate cyberspace, and I'll go into more of these in detail. You have to work in advance. Uh, you got to rely on getting lots of research intelligence gathering, and then this thing you have to decide when you're going to throw your zero days and when you're going to throw your known exploits. Okay. So uh, what's, this, what's this thing I mean when I say dominate cyberspace? This is something that came up on the Daily Dave mailing list um, that, that kind of got me interested. So um, the idea, I think it's a good idea. So, so the idea is you want to control as many devices in the world as possible before you are, you're ready to sort of launch your attack. And um, the idea is that if there really was some sort of you know cyber attack or cyber war or whatever you want to call it, um, presumably the internet would be kind of degraded, at least in, in places. And so if you control lots and lots of devices, then you can still perform your attack even if you can't connect to say the target anymore. So so that's one good thing. The other thing is uh, there's this problem with cyber war about attribution, right? So attribution is who did it. Uh, so you know, you, you maybe a computer from China is attacking, but really that computer is some some Russian dude who's logged into that computer, right? So you can't tell if it was Russia or China. Um, so the idea is with this dominate cyberspace is if you have, you know, all you know tons and tons and tons of computers located all throughout the world under your control, then uh, it's you're you're in a better position to decide who's attacking you because maybe they're attacking from one of the boxes you already control, in which case you can you know easily backtrace it. Uh, if not, maybe you're at least located in a computer nearby, right, in the same, you know, same subnet or, or whatever. So anyway, you have a better idea. And, and also, uh, on the opposite side, it's going to make attribution like really hard for your opponent because you're going to be able to attack from like a thousand different places and from all over the world and they're not going to know who you are. Um, and, and the other thing is if you already happen to have all these boxes throughout the world under your control, then just by luck sometimes, you know, Kim Jong Il is going to be like, hey Charlie, uh, yeah, you know, we really want to get onto this network. And I'll be like, oh, you know, as a, you know, as a matter of fact, I'm already on that network. Haha. -ha. <laughs> so, uh, and then of course, the, the final point is that if you want to do something, you know, sort of loud, like a denial of service, well, you're going to need a lot of computers to do that. So it's good anyway. So the idea is, for this, is is you want to just go out and just, you know, control lots and lots of computers. And this is the, the other reason why it's good to be North Korea as opposed to the U.S. because. You know, there, there might be like laws and stuff that say you're not supposed to just take over everybody's computer for no reason, but like North Korea, they're cool with that. <laughs> okay, so uh, the next thing is, and that was already started talking about this, is advanced planning. So if you're going to try to get into like a really hard network, some military network, or you know, some, uh, you know, the, the network of the stock exchange or something like that, it's going to take, you know, some, you're not just going to be able to wake up and do that. No matter how many guns I get pointed at my head, I'm going to be like, it's going to take me some time. So, uh, the other thing is it's going to be easier to not be detected if you go slow. So it's a key part of, of my, my thing is, is to take your time and, and, and do everything else. Uh, so, and, and likewise, part of taking your time is, is figuring out what you're doing and, and doing research. And figuring out uh, additionally what defenses and monitoring are in place so that you don't get caught. So, so like everyone who talks about you know, the Aurora attack right, and, and app and all that stuff. And uh, you know, I've had so many people tell me, "Oh, that Aurora attack, man, that was sophisticated, right?" And it was like, "No, it's not, because you know, if I was doing that attack, I wouldn't get caught. So it's not sophisticated." <laughs> um, the other question is, so you know, at some point, I'm going to have this stockpile of zero days and a stockpile of, of known vulnerabilities. When am I going to? And I want to get on somewhere. Which do I decide to use? And so it's going to be something you have to decide case by case. But uh, basically, if you if you choose to use a, a you know a known vulnerability, a known exploit. Then you know the advantages are you can just look like some you know teenage hacker, and, and also if you get busted, who cares? Uh, the zero days are going to be way harder to detect, so you might want to use those for you know the harder targets to get into. Um, but the problem is if you do get caught, then that's that's a lot of resources you've used to find that zero day and, and to, to to weaponize it, and so uh, it's going to be expensive in time and money to replace. Okay, so then there's some other things you might consider doing. Uh, so like Richard Clark is huge on on like oh logic bombs, logic bombs. So uh, like I I hadn't read that word since you know my, I read Hacking Exposed 15 years ago or something, uh, but he loves it. And so the idea is that you, you get into you know like the hardware of the other guys and you plant these things and then you just turn a switch and like the whole world ends. 
but I, I think it, I think it's kind of stupid. So I, I, that's not in my strategy. Um, the other one is like, and part of mine is like, oh, I'm gonna build up this botnet. Uh, and so it's like, well, why don't I just pay off some criminal who already has a botnet and uh, use his, right? Save save some time or whatever. And so I say for that, I, I don't go for that either because a, they're criminals, so you can't really trust them. And b, uh, there's uh, oh, there was another one I swear, but I can't think of it. Anyway, uh, so so I'm not gonna do that. Uh, I guess it's only just they're, they're you know. You just can't deal with those guys, and, and they're you know they're, not only can you not trust that they're not just going to take it back or do something else, but but you want to keep it sort of secret, right? You don't want to be telling all these guys. Um, the other thing is you could have like you know pay a Microsoft employee fifty grand to go put a bug in in uh, or a backdoor in some some IE code or something or Cisco or whatever. So uh, you could do that, and it would be it would be easier. But again, you kind of have to worry about that getting out at some point. Okay, next. <laughs> You can see I was like having fun with Photoshop one day. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and I'm not, I'm not actually that good at it either. So, so what's my, uh, what, what sort of things do I see uh, attacked? So, so like first off, like you know, I'm just, I'm doing whatever Kim Jong Il tells me to do at this point, right? And uh, I don't really know what his plans are. He's, he's not like totally like right in the mind. So uh, I'm just like, okay, I'm going to prepare for everything you could possibly ask for, and then I'm, you know, when you tell me to do it, I'll just hopefully already have that in place to do it. So, so what are some like crazy things that he might come up with? You know, hey Charlie, uh, I want you to shut down the internet. It's like, well, you know, I'll do my best. Uh, I mean, I'm no Dan Kaminsky. So, uh, so other things I might do is financial markets, you know, air transportation, power stuff. Um, you know, maybe d break up the communication in the military. Uh, you know, cell phone networks. This is like really easy to do because I haven't been able to use my phone in like a week here in Las Vegas. <laughs> Okay, next up, uh, tasks. So these are the actual things that uh, I. So, so, so the the last the last bit was what he might want me to do, and this is the things I'm going to prepare to do, and hopefully these things will allow me to do the things he wants me to do. And uh, yeah, everyone loves my book there in North Korea. <laughs> okay, so, so these are the things I want to do: communication redundancy. So I want to make sure that if parts of the internet go away, uh, that I can still uh, you know do my job. Which is to destroy other, the U.S. capitalist pigs. Okay, distributed denial of service. I want to be able to get into like really hard targets, like well, turn networks. Uh, I want to take down core infrastructure, and uh, then there's these like air gap networks I'm going to talk about and how I would attack those. All right, so so I mentioned this uh, already. So I want to have redundant communication to all these computers that, that I'm, I'm launching my attack from throughout the world. Um, so the idea is that uh, the people. So not just the, the computers, but I want to have people like stationed throughout the world too, right? Uh, so if I, I don't want to have like all my, my cyber army like holed up in a in a bunker in North Korea, right? Because then all you gotta do is you know snip the cables going into North Korea. There's probably like two, and I'm gonna be shut out. So I want to have like people you know all over the world, and in this case I'm attacking the U.S. So like have them all over the U.S. as well. Um, and likewise, I want to have communication to those people and to like other you know computers that I own through lots of different ways. So instead of you know, so I'm assuming the internet at some point is going to be difficult to use when I'm doing all these things. Uh, so I want to have like be able to talk over the phone lines, over like satellite phones, you know, anything I can think of. The idea is even if the internet like somehow like became completely unusable, I could still communicate with with these computers to continue the attack, or, or you know, I could actually stop the attack if I wanted to. Okay, so what next? Uh, well, you know, this is like, I really even hate to bring it up because it's so like anti, it's so dirty, right, and, and messy. But, you know, the great leader says he might want it, so I need, I need to be prepared. So denial of service. So, you know, you flood too much traffic. Um, and, and the point to make here is like if, if the internet would go away or if, you know, Google went away or, or you know, Gmail or whatever, like North Korea is just fine with that. Like the, the, camp, the average person in North Korea could care less if the internet is functioning or not. Where like other countries might have to actually worry about this. But I don't. Okay, and then, uh, you know, how am I going to get this botnet? Well, basically I'm going to just use, you know, a crap load of, I mean, basically the, how the bad guys do it. And, and, and the idea to me is like, man, if these bad guys are, you know, they're, I'm not saying they're not smart, but, uh, you know, they're not, they can't be that organized. They, you know, they can't be more than a handful of people, I would guess. Uh, doing you know one, you know a particular botnet, and I'm gonna have if you, when you see my sites like hundreds of people, and, you know, trained people like with like management and stuff. So I don't see why any reason I can't make like way huger botnets than they can. So so the idea is uh, just collect a bunch of boxes, make sure that no one else is on them, clean them up as much as you can, and move on. 
And uh, for this task, I'm not gonna use any zero days because obviously when you look at the size of botnets, you don't have to. Um, so, so what else do I wanna worry about as far as the North Korean botnets? Um, so, so, so I wanna make sure that I use different botnet software for different botnets. Uh, I want to have them make sure they're, they're uh, you know, the same thing that normal botnets have so they're not centrally controlled. So you can't just like take out one, one computer and then all of a sudden I can't communicate with my botnets. I want to make sure they're all over the, all over the world. Uh, so again, if you like snip off communications to one country, it doesn't really affect it. And all over the, the, the target country too. So like even if the target country, uh, you know, disconnects itself from the internet or from parts of, the, parts of it from the internet, I can still keep doing my denial of service. And the idea is to make it just humongous, like 100 times bigger than anyone we've seen so far. This is just a picture to show uh, like the diversity of what I'm talking about. So even in the US, I have like, you know, however many, seven different botnets, like all different code, all different communications. Um, so if you take out one of those colors, you, you can't, it doesn't really affect the overall um, picture of things. And there are, you know, throughout the world and the country. All right, and then there's gonna be these, you know, hard targets, like, you know, he's, you know, Kim Jong-un is gonna roll in one day and I'm, you know, happily typing away. He's gonna be like, yeah, Charlie, I need to get into, you know, Wall Street computers, do it. Uh, I need to get into, you know, uh, you know, NSA's top secret network. And I'll be like, okay. So, uh, how, so, so, so these are hard, right? Um, and the idea is, uh, the, the way I differentiate a hard target from like, you know, an easy target, is that they actually have a security team, they actually have, uh, uh, you know, dedicated security devices and, and that sort of thing, and that's what makes it hard. But if you look at botnets and, uh, you know, how big they are and, and the sorts of nodes they have, there might not actually be a hard target. Like, there's, there's, you know, computers that are owned, like, all over and, and all companies and stuff. But uh, still, I imagine there'll be some that'll be harder than others to get into. So, so the way I do this, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but the idea is, is just basic, like, pen testing. Uh, you just take your time, do research, uh, you know, gain trust, get in somewhere, and then uh, spread your, your, your control. So this is, uh, you know, the so-called apt, right? I, except I just do it uh, in a very advanced way. So this is like some, here's me spreading throughout, uh, this was like way cooler to NATO than you guys, but um, <laughs> this is like spreading throughout uh, a, a corporate network. So the only thing that's cool about this is it's, it's like the Cisco safe diagram, so this, that, was, that was a secure secure network, right? But like, you, obviously, you can still break into it. Um, so uh, then what, what's next? So, uh, you know, like I said, Dan already coined that he broke the internet with DNS, so I gotta be able to do something to DNS. Uh, the other things I'm gonna care about is like core routers. So uh, what am I gonna do to, to like DNS servers and core routers? Uh, denial service is one option. Uh, you know, there's like, specific attacks against, you know, poison routing tables. So this is like happened accidentally, so I'm gonna do it on purpose. And then, uh, you can do the hard target approach, so I find out, you know, who's the admin of this particular core router, and I break into his computer or his, like, sister's computer or whatever, and, you know, slowly trace it back to figure out, you know, what he does. And then, of course, you know, it's, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I consider myself, a, like, a bug finder, right? That's, that's my, my specialty, and so, so this part is, like, really exciting to me. It's like, oh, I, I get to have all these, like, really smart guys looking for bugs, and I'll, instead of looking at, in, you know, Reader all the time, I'll be looking in, like, you know, Cisco IOS, although I don't know if they call that anymore because, like iPhone bought that or something. Uh, Juniper stuff, like, and, and the bind implementation and, and Microsoft uh, DNS. And the thing that, that's really exciting about this is you don't actually necessarily have to control this, right, and take it over. It's, it's good enough to just find a denial of service, which is usually, like, pretty easy to find. So if I can just keep crashing, like, a core router, that's pretty, pretty good if I want to, you know, make things hard. All right, so I talked about these air gap systems earlier. Um, so what is it? So if you have, like, a really, if you really want to have a, a secure network, so, like, you know, a nuclear power plant or something, right? You don't necessarily want this thing plugged in the internet because you don't want some guy in, uh, you know, Yugoslavia attacking you or something. So uh, the way you do that is you just you just make sure you're not plugged in the internet, right? Uh, and then you don't have to worry about that. And so examples of this is like you know some top secret network, electrical grids, that sort of thing. Um, the idea is that you know it's not impossible to attack this; it's just a lot harder. And the example is this, this uh, military network called uh, JWIX was compromised because someone plugged a, a compromised USB stick into it. So, so there's ways to get into these and I'll talk about um, my approach. So I, I know there's a, there was an approach in, in the past that talked about having malware that would sort of like save up information and then it's wait, 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 and then if ever it saw it was on the internet it would hurry up and like punch it all out. But that's not the approach I take. So the approach I take is to try to put these systems back on the internet. 
Um, and, and, and this is going to take people, right? It's not, you can't, my plan isn't all just sitting around with computers. It's going to take people out doing stuff. So the idea is you have to get someone inside this network like physically somehow. So uh, I'm going to have these like North Koreans or maybe I, you know, my sleeper cell, uh, you know, people in college in the U.S. or something, you know, join these companies or pay off people, pay off a janitor, whatever. Uh, and so I get them into this network and I start plugging in devices into to, to, you know, their computer. So maybe, uh, you know, modems to, to, to dial out over the phone line or some, you know, some other way. But the idea is to just get, get a way that I can start to remotely attack this, this, this network that is not supposed to have internet access. And I've had people come up to me about this and be like, oh, that's impossible. I am minister of network and I know as soon as someone plugs in a USB stick in any computer. And I'm like, well, you know, that's bullshit, right? If, if I walk, if I have, if you give me like unlimited physical access to your network, I'm eventually going to be able to have a way that I'm going to have, you know, a computer or a device on your network and you're not going to know about it. So uh, anyway, it's just a matter, I think, of time and, and you know, effort to, to, to do that. All right, so it's the defenses. I laugh at defenses. We all, we all had a good laugh about this. <laughs> all right, so, so, so what are the things that, that a target country could do uh, to, to try to, to stop this, this attack, right? They're like, oh shit, Charlie Miller is working for the Koreans. We got to like figure out what we're going to do. So, um, so some, some ideas I've already sort of mentioned is uh, you could try to segregate yourself. So, uh, the U.S. might not be able to do this so easily, but like a smaller country like South Korea, which would also be a, a favorite target of, of the great leader, uh, they could just say like, screw you guys, we're just going to be our own internet for a while. Um, the other thing is you could try to, you know, put out IDSs and, and try to catch us. Uh, you could do like, uh, you know, typical Akamai anti-DOS stuff. And then I already mentioned the air gapping systems. All right, so, uh, so for segregating, uh, you could either like physically cut the wires or you could just put such aggressive filters on, on it that almost nothing gets through. And the way that I get around this is, uh, again, I said I, I've already pre-positioned everything presumably before any of the, you know, this stuff is going down. So uh, yeah, okay, you cut off yourself from the internet, but I still have a bunch of compromised computers on your, your network that, that before it's been cut off. And I can still communicate with them through ways besides the internet so I can still attack you even if you segregate yourself. So thanks, but, but that's not going to work. Uh, the next thing is filtering. So uh, you know, like the U.S. is working on this this so-called Einstein IDS thing, right? So uh, obviously they think that this is a good idea, um, but I, I don't think it's that great. So uh, the uh, the botnet clients that I'm I'm, I'm shipping, their communication, uh, the 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 exploits I'm using, these are all custom things. So there won't be uh, specific signatures for them. There might be some generic ones, but as you see, I'm going to test against all the antivirus and stuff that I can get my hands on. So it's going to be really hard with a uh, with a filtering device to to catch this. And the other thing is because I'm using one, so I don't just like use the same you know one piece of bot code or the same one uh, you know rat or whatever. I have lots of different versions of each one that are each uh, different. So if by chance you know my guy totally screws up one day and uh, he gets caught. And then they ship this off to all, you know, McAfee and Symantec and all this stuff, and they have signatures and, and all that. So, so it doesn't, it's not like, hey, we caught, we caught this guy at Google, oh, oh crap. We also see that the same thing is being used here, 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 and here, right? So that's not going to happen because I'm going to have so many different versions of, of all my software. All right, what about, uh, you know, in, for the now service case, you know, they really, really want whitehouse.gov to be up. So uh, they, they hire Akamai or they set up their own sort of, sort of system. And so I would say, well, because I have this, this, first of all, I have this enormous botnet. And second of all, it's uh, geographically diverse. So uh, that's the main thing that they use to, to stop you. And so it, it won't actually help you here. And then I already mentioned air gap systems. Uh, well, for one thing, you can't actually air gap every system or else the internet is, like, doesn't exist, right? Um, and the other thing is uh, I already mentioned that I would try to un-air gap the ones that, that are air gapped. Okay, so now let's talk about, that's what I want to do and why I think it, it, it will be hard to defend against. So now let's talk about exactly what I think I'm going to need. Do you see me in this picture? It's like a where's Waldo. I'm on my iPhone in the background. <laughs> I must be in the doghouse at this point. I'm not up by the leader. Okay, so, so these are all the guys I think I'm going to need. I don't know if you can, if you can see it. I'm going to go through each one so, so you don't need to worry about it for now. So these are, these are all the different like job tiles. When, so they'll be like, uh, you know, advertising on, on threat post or something. Hey, seeking, you know, person willing to develop vulnerabilities. All right. And, and then uh, part of this too is 
so I, I had a conversation with someone about like how are you going to get these people, right? I, I guess I'll get into this later. So let me just just talk for now about this. So, so you're going to need people who can find bugs, right? Because you got to have your zero days. So uh, I, I was saying it's, it's going to be tough. Like this isn't something you're going to start with. Like take a high school kid and then train them to do it, right? You're going to probably have to find some people who already know what they're doing. Um, so you're going to try to fi hire all these people, and then they're, you're going to set them to have their task to be find bugs in browsers, find bugs in like uh, core services like DNS and HTTP servers, um, and uh, you know core routers, and then uh, you know maybe phones, whatever. And then uh, you're also going to want them looking for bugs in kernels like uh, Tavis and Julian. So uh, these bugs will allow you to elevate privileges, allow you to break out sandboxes, that sort of thing. The next thing you're going to need is people to take those vulnerabilities and turn them into exploits. So it used to be that you know basically the the same person who did that who found bugs could find could write exploits, but now it's getting so hard you pretty much it's it's almost a different skill set. Uh, for example, I'm like way better at finding bugs than writing exploits. Uh, so so these guys are going to be you know be writing exploits for for known vulnerabilities and for for uh, zero days. Uh, it's you know it's, it takes a lot of skill with all the defenses that are put in place by by operating system vendors these days. They're going to be able to have to write it for you know all you know Windows, Linux, Cisco, whatever. Uh, they're going to have to be able to defeat ASLR DEP, sandboxing, whatever they run into. So it's hard. Um, so, so these are those are uh, the guys who are going to be writing the exploits. The next are going to be the guys who are trying to get nodes for the for the botnet, right? In case like you know I personally will try to recommend him not doing that because it's so so yucky, but uh, he might want to do it. So. Uh, for this, I'm gonna, you know, be using the client side exploits that that my exploit writers are writing, and these are, like I already mentioned, these are gonna be for known known vulnerabilities. And then, uh, you know, just do the same thing that the, the stupid criminals do. Oh, and I'm also gonna have, uh, the, yeah, I'm gonna have to have servers that are, you know, serving out these exploits. So I have to maintain those. Uh, and then once I have this like gigantic botnet, I'm gonna have people who are in charge of making sure that it's always up. They're going to test that it works, make sure that it's diverse, that sort of thing. Also, you know, occasionally people are going to like reinstall their system, buy new computers, that sort of thing. So, so this is going to be their job to make sure that that the, the botnet as is, is you know continues to be useful. Um, next are going to be the guys who are basically like the pen testers who are going to be getting into these hard targets. So they have to you know research networks, uh, you know, be able to use exploits, obviously. Um, uh, you know, figure you know figure out how to expand within a network. Uh, install things, whatever. Um, then these, the remote personnel are going to be the guys who are sort of physically spread out throughout the world, trying to uh, make sure that we have this redundant communication, trying to get jobs at you know important places, and you know bribing janitors, whatever. Uh, and then I'm going to have to have a bunch of developers who are going to be writing my tools for me. So like you know writing a botnet is it's just software. You can get any developer to do that if you you know pay them adequately and put a bag over their head or whatever. Uh, so um, what else? Uh, we're going to need tools for everybody else. Uh, where some of this stuff is going to be like rootkit, you know, in the kernel. So we're going to need some kernel developers. Um, and then uh, it's not, it's important, although I hate to admit it, but like testers are really important. So uh, they're going to have to test our exploits, our all our tools, make sure everything's functioning, and they're going to buy like every IDS on Earth and, and make sure none of our stuff's detected, and you know, check that periodically. And then you know, if you take a guy like Mark Dowd, he's you know the smartest guy that I've ever met. But still, he doesn't know about SCADA or about you know whatever us little very particular niche that that we care about. So we're gonna have to have consultants come in and and you know tell us what to do as far as if we want to take down these uh, you know very specific things like SCADA systems or something. And then we gotta have you know your, your system ends to keep things running. Uh, that's it. So, so these are the different job titles. Um, let's see, 15 minutes. I think I have some time. So uh, next is how much I think these are going to cost. How many people I think I need for each of these. All right. And then for cost, like I only talk about hardware, software, and, pe and people. Like I don't know how, like how much. Uh, I'm assuming that North Korea already has like some buildings set up and stuff, and you know they already have like support staff to you know, uh, you know make sure we have electricity and that sort of stuff. And you know they, they don't. People in North Korea don't really need health insurance in retirement, so that's not an issue. Um, so so this is what I was alluding to earlier. So. You know, you're not going to really, you know, I, in my story, they got me, you know, the, the old-fashioned way, right? They, they, they kidnapped me. So uh, not everyone's going to go for that, right? You're not going to be able to kidnap like a thousand people. So, uh, so you're going to, like, how are you going to get people to, 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 to do this cyber army thing? 
Um, so there, there's a couple ways. First, I like pay them pretty good, right? So pay is always good. But still, no matter how much you pay someone, they might be like really patriotic, or they might be like, well, I'm sort of worried about after the, the cyber attack, like what are you gonna do with me? So, uh, so, so it might be hard to get people to do this, right? So, uh, you know, originally, my, when I talked at NATO, I didn't really talk about this subject. This came up in the question and answer part. Um, so, uh, I was just like, well, I'm just going to pay him a lot. But, but there's other ways you could do it. And, you know, like various movies, plots, right? So you just have lots of, hire all the consulting companies, give them one little piece. Hey, I want you to develop this piece of code. It's kind of like a, you know, piece of bot software or whatever. Or I want you to find, you know, I want to buy a zero day exploit from you. Um, whatever. And, and so be, between all that, you get enough tools to, to do the things you want to do. Um, and, and it's better. Like, so, so this was something else to point out to me. Like, it's like, well, uh, you know, by your cyber army, you were hiring up all the best people, right? And like all of a sudden next year at Black Hat, there's like nobody there. So <laughs> people are going to notice there's something going on, right? And you know, I was like, oh, that is, that is true. So uh, that, that, it's better if you can figure out a way to sort of you know, do it through the consulting uh, route or something. Okay, so, uh, so here's, here's the number of people, what I think they'll cost. I'm going to go kind of quick. You can check out the slides for details. So uh, vulnerability analysis this is like basically what I consider myself, so someone who finds bugs. So you need like 10 guys that you're going to like, you know, pay very, very well to find all the bugs. I think it's hard, but I'm biased because that's what I do. Um, and then like 10 just like CS majors, right? Guys who, uh, you know, who just graduated, but they don't necessarily know much. And so $3 million a year for, for these guys. Uh, exploit developers. So these are the guys who are figuring out, so you got, first you got 10 guys who are like, you know, super elite dudes who, you know, they know how to get around, they can, they can figure out new ways to get around mitigations. So they're sort of almost like the theoretical guys and, and they're also writing some exploits. And then you've got 40 of these guys who basically know how to write exploits, but they're not like, uh, you know, rocking the world with their research or anything. And then you just got like 20 dudes to kick around too. So seven million bucks for those guys. So these are all US dollars too, like you can probably do it way cheaper in Korea, but I don't, I don't know what Korean currency is like. So, uh, and then these guys, these are the guys who are basically like the current criminals, right? Uh, the guys who, 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 who get nodes for the, for the botnet. So um, 50, 50, you know, good guys, 10 like little, I always like to have like 10 guys to kick around. So four, four million dollars. Then the, the 200, so this is like the, the, the majority, almost half of my workforce, I think, are these guys. These are the guys that just try to maintain this like huge, huge botnet, make sure it's still working, test it, that sort of thing. 200 guys who, who had like degrees in computer science and then like 20 other kind of college kids. $12 million. Uh, these are the pen tester guys, 50 of those guys, because there's going to be like a lot of networks they're going to want to get in. Um, and like for comparison, the company I work for is like 12 guys. So this army is like way huger than, than mine. Uh, okay, 10, 10 guys to kick around. These are the guys that are like wandering around the world trying to get jobs and stuff. Um, I, so I don't actually pay for them because I figure like, you know, it's not really a technical job, right? They, the North Korea probably has people who are already good at this. Um, so these are the developers. So these are the guys writing the code for us, writing the botnets, that sort of thing. Uh, 10 like really skilled guys, 20 just like, you know, straight out of college and then 10, 10 kicker rounder guys. Um, testers, and then these are like everyone else. So these are the consultants. So I'm, I'm willing to drop $2 million a year on, on people that tell me how SCADA systems work and how, you know, uh, Wall Street systems work and that sort of thing. Um, and again, maybe I'm biased because I'm a consultant. Uh, sysadmins and then managers. Like as much as I hate managers, I end up spending a fortune on them. So uh, six million dollars. All right, what kind of equipment do I need? Well, uh, I don't think I need that much equipment really. So a couple computers for people to work on, uh, like a oh, like a real kick-ass lab with like all equipment that like you know core routers and, and that sort of thing, switches, uh, phones, whatever. And then of course you know the, the mandatory software you would need. And uh, what about the servers that are going to host our exploits for collecting bots? And we'll just take those over. We don't need to actually buy them. All right. So in all, the, my my cyber army, 600 people. Uh, you know, 45 million in salary. Uh, so it's you know not a bad average salary, and uh, three million in equipment. All right. So so here's the the pie chart. See, I'm truly. This is like my in my slide deck that I would present to the great leader. So. Uh, <laughs> You get, on the left is, is how many people, and on the right is how much it co they cost. So you can see like the biggest pie chunk is the, is the guys who just are maintaining the botnets. And then the, the sort of like super advanced people are the kind of in the top. So on the yellow is the, uh, the, like the pen testing type guys, and the, the green are the exploit writers, and in the middle the little blue pie slice is the, the guys who find bugs. 
I have sysadmins for that. That's, that, that was the sysadmins. I don't know where they are on here. They are, they're red. They're the teeny little sliver next to the, the, the operators. So, yeah, I, you know, they're willing to work 24 hours a day, I'm sure. All right, so then this is, uh, I, I can't just roll this out like immediately. So I have to take some time to get everything rolling and I, and I have a two year plan and this is it. Okay, so what am I gonna do? So, and, and I assume like I have like base, I'm not counting the part where it takes like hire everybody and you know, get everyone sitting at their desk and stuff or whatever. But like when we're ready to go, uh, for the first three months we're gonna get our remote guys, you know, flown out the world, starting to set up their equipment, trying to get jobs. More and more analyst guys start looking for bugs. Uh, the exploit developers start writing and polishing exploits for known vulnerabilities. Um, uh, the developers start writing their, their bot software and their rats. And uh, there's just some basic research done on like who do we, you know, who do we think the hard targets are going to be, uh, you know, what sort of systems do they use. It's very basic research at this point. So three months down the drain and Kim Jong-il is like, okay, we're ready to roll, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, we haven't really done anything yet but trust me, two years we're going to be ready to rock. Okay, next three months. Uh, we, you know, hopefully the bug finder guys will find a couple zero days, uh, some DOS bugs and, you know, like DNS servers or whatever. Um, we start to, the, since there's, the exploit writers start writing some zero day exploits based on those bugs they found, uh, or bot or whatever. Uh, we start to collect botnets, hard targets, you know, we, we, we roll not like typical pen testing trying to get trust established and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Robin saging it, so to speak. Okay, next three months. Uh, we start to get into the hard targets with our zero days. Uh, we start to clean up uh, and uh, collect. So we so our botnet at this point is somewhere like you know 500,000 hosts or something, which is by cyber criminal standards like pretty small. Uh, I got all of our remote communications all set up. Or we're still writing some software because remember we can't just have one. We need to have like 10 copies or 10 different versions of every software we use. So after one year's gone by, this is like a huge investment, right? Kim Jong-il has spent $50 million and he's, he's wanting to know what's going on. Uh, well, we're, we're sort of in some hard networks. We're not like, you know, controlling them like totally yet. We got 5 million hosts, which is like a pretty large botnet by today's standards. Not like, you know, blow you away, but still it's big. Um, we've got zero days uh, exploits available for most things that we would want. Um, you know, sometimes some of these are going to get patched. We'll have to have new ones, so we have multiple of each. And we're inside, uh, you know, some some critical systems. Maybe we've unair gapped a couple. Okay, six six more months. Uh, by now, like the the hard networks are basically totally owned. Like it's going to be really hard to ever get us out. Uh, our botnet is getting pretty enormous at this point. So 100 million hosts. Uh, we've got lots of zero days, and we we've we've unair gapped a bunch of systems, and, and are starting to compromise those. Finally, after two years, we basically, like all the hard targets we thought we would care about, we like totally own them. Maybe we've gotten caught a couple times, but for the most part, we're in good shape. We've got like, this is like, I would love to see if this is possible. 20% of personal computers owned by us. Um, like it's, it sounds like a lot, but if you think about like how many grandmas and stuff are out there, it seems reasonable. Uh, and then uh, of course, and, and then the air gap systems. Okay, so then one day, you know, Kim Jong Il walks in with his his generals or whatever, and he's like, "Okay, Charlie, today's the day that I paid you for. Today's the day we attack, right? Somebody pissed me off. So uh, this is this is the kind of things I can imagine doing. And the bottom line is, if, if given the two years, uh, you know, advance notice, it's uh, you know, it's it's pretty much a done deal at this point. Okay. So <laughs> conclusions. <laughs> But yeah, so, so they never stood a chance against me, me and the leader. Uh, although he prefers champagne and I, I like beer. Okay, so, so what, what lessons can you draw from this? So like as, as much fun as I had thinking this up, like I went to NATO for God's sakes, right? So it couldn't have been that evil. I, you know, I was hoping that some, some like good would come from it. And uh, there's, not, there's not much you can really do, but there's, there's some stuff you can do. So uh, the idea is that with enough patience and money and time, it's going to be really hard to stop a skilled attacker. This is the typical uh, defender's dilemma. Um, and again, like, you know, the, the, the caveat is I, I, I play offense only, so maybe I'm sort of biased that way. Um, the other thing is, like, I spend all my money on people. I think people are way more important than equipment for this. And uh, taking down the, the whole internet, uh, you know, I don't know about that, but uh, the point is it, it'll be even harder if you want to take down parts of the internet and not your own, but for me, I don't care as, as a North Korean citizen. Um, there's lots of talk about backdooring everything you see in the media. Uh, I don't think North Korea could really easily do that. 
and, you, and I don't even think it's necessary, so I don't, I don't think that would be part of the plan. Uh, the other thing is that my cyber war plans involve people being around the world and doing things. It's not just something you can do uh, totally remotely. Um, so, so what about defense? Uh, the only thing that you can really take away from this, I think, defensively, is that you have time, right? So, so when 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 Kim Jong Il walked into my office after two years, like the U.S. was screwed. There was nothing that was going to stop me at that point. But for those two years I was building up, that would have been time you could have tried to detect it and stop it. So, uh, so so that's sort of the I hope the takeaway is that it's going to take time, and, and you're going to have a chance to, to catch the people early. But but by the end, it's going to be too late. Oh, and then I go on my little rant about how vendors need to write better software and, and how and that sort of thing. But that was mostly for the NATO guys. I even took out a whole slide about that. Okay, uh, thanks to to the guys who who gave me an early brief or early read of this because again, it's like I usually feel more comfortable with like assembly language on the screen because no one can argue that what XOR does. But you know, th this is sort of a lot of opinion, so I wanted to make sure I was sort of on base. Um, and and that's it. So happy. I guess I'm head, do I heading off to another room or. Capri 112 if you want to chat about building a cyber army or check out my career and stuff. <laughs>